been a long time since I've had a chance to just connect with each of you. Really excited for football. Um, there is a sense of normalcy that it appears and feels like we're approaching, uh, and that doesn't mean we've arrived. It, but it feels a little bit different uh, than it did going into the fall. There's so many more knowns, even though there are still unknowns, and COVID routines and protocols are so well established, um, and we've been through it um, now for a significant amount of time, that um, I, I would just say that uh, that in and of itself is a stabilizing factor. We've had a, what I think is a very successful off season and have worked really diligently and really hard in regards to that. And so that was normal in terms of the off season component. Even though there are masks and COVID protocols, the expectations, the standards, the work ethic, and the intent was the same as if it was um, normal circumstances. And our intent will be to carry that through in the spring. That doesn't mean at the expense of player safety. It doesn't mean at the expense of COVID protocols. But those things are learning. We're learning to have them coexist at a different level um, after after kind of the exploratory and, and learning phase of, of what we saw as we took it on early in the fall. Um, so, yeah, we're anxious to play uh, and looking forward to it. So, yeah, with that, I'll be glad to just address questions as they come. situation similar in some ways to the spring of 2019 when you came into spring ball with a returning starter a quarterback who knew who knew the system how much does that enable you to accelerate things at least on the offensive side of the ball when you have that guy behind center oh it, it's um it's essential it's pivotal it's it's a determinant in terms of how how fast you can go and the confidence of your team uh, the Coastal Division this year, if you look at the number of returning quarterbacks, um, yeah, it sets up for a lot of parity and just kind of a ferocious season, it looks like, um, with most quarterbacks coming back. I love our chances, um, which are as good as anyone's, with Brennan back. Uh, when I think back to a year ago, and really uh, as the architect and designer of the program, uh, basically three forces all kind of came together um, that I didn't plan for uh, appropriately enough. Uh, number one, we, we certainly had the COVID uh, and playing in a pandemic, which I think we did a really nice job of, of health and safety of our players. I felt really good about that. Um, but what we didn't do is is drive the culture and the will development and kind of the, the how we normally build teams. Um, and I'm not gonna say I missed on the side of safety, but we certainly erred on the side of safety to make sure our players were safe. So. Um, I'm going back to framing your question about Brennan. So we had that and a new quarterback and I think the most difficult schedule we've ever taken on with just conference game after conference game. And so those three things came together. Then my job was to anticipate all of that, frame all of that, and put protocols in place um, and have the roster tested um, if we were deep enough and, and uh, capable enough with the schemes and designs we had in place to handle it all. And I liked the way we started, and then Brennan got hurt right in there for about a game and a half, and then we kind of restarted, and then we looked like we could play football for a while. And then I, we didn't finish the way I was hoping um, in our last game. Uh, but all that together with Brennan, my point is having Brennan go through all of that, what I just described, that, be, that might be almost like two seasons worth of experience because <laughs> the depth of different things and different leadership opportunities and different self-discovery and understanding Wow, that in terms of his progression, that might have been a blessing in disguise um, now looking back on it. And so I, I'm so glad he's back, and it absolutely puts our team in a different place. One more, if I can stick with Brennan, that um, last year he kind of struggled with ball security the first four or five games, then got much better in, in that department when he came back from the injury. Uh, was that as simple as? Hey, a kid in his first game action, kind of getting used to the speed, or did you guys learn about the positions to, to put him in and not put him in there? It, it was more of the second with some of the first. Um, so it was really just what, um, where, and how to use Brennan most appropriately 
where is he most comfortable? Where is he most successful within our existing um, composite of plays and style that we have and what might, what might we need to adapt for him? And so basically there was a process of discovery. We, ex- we were accelerating it pretty quickly from Duke to Clemson. There was some nice growth right there. Um, the early part of the NC State game was not what we were hoping for. Uh, and then by the time he came back, after we had a chance to reflect on what we had seen, we were able to, I think, relaunch him more appropriately with what he really felt comfortable doing, where he currently was, and we had enough film and repetition to evaluate that at a little bit higher level. So um, I think it's more of the second what you said with a little bit of the first, um, but both contributed. It seems like you will keep replacing them. You're going to replace Terrell this year. How, how much does that say, not only about the guys you're identifying to come in, but also Coach Hagens and his value to this program? I'll start in reverse order. So Coach Hagens is exemplary um, as a human being, first and foremost, as a friend, um, as a partner in this work, and as someone so passionate about UVA, but he's the exact kind of person I would like um, young people to be around. In fact, I tried to convince my son Breaker to stay um, and walk on to UVA rather than go on <laughs> so he could play with play for Coach Hagens. Um, I didn't win that battle. Um, but that wasn't because of Coach Hagens, and Breaker loved Coach Hagens just like all of our players do. And so I'm so lucky he's here. I believe the statistics uh, say that Coach Hagens has developed or coached five of the top ten leading receivers in UVA history, and that number will continue. So that's the Coach Hagens part. The other part is, uh, yes, this could be our strongest receiving core yet. Um, So our succession planning at every position is critical to program consistency. Um, And you know that I I love and thrive on unbroken growth. That's how I'm satisfied. That's how I'm fulfilled to continue to see us getting better. And last year was a real challenge when all the different circumstances came together and I didn't see us truly get better in terms of record, right? And and I understand how important that is. But I do see a program that continues to add the right players and the right positions to have as good a chance as anyone to win the Coastal Division. And we expect to win. We expect to be in the postseason. We expect to compete for the Coastal Championship. Those, those things aren't, we're not wondering. We expect that. And the succession planning is allowing that. And then to your point about Coach Hagan's then I think our players are being coached in a manner that develop them um, appropriately so when it's their turn, they're ready. And that's, that's when the program really starts gaining traction, footing, and becomes not a team, it's a program, right, where there's kind of consistency and repetition of results um, where it's not so longer um, the, big, the way ups and the way downs. It's just, oh, yeah, UVA, they're always going to be good. And that's, we're building toward that. Coach, you mentioned this a little bit, but I wanted to ask how close is this spring to normal compared to previous springs at the same time? Just how valuable is it to have a spring this year in some capacity for your program? Wow. I, I couldn't have answered that until I saw what it was like without a spring. But now that now that I've seen that, there's so much to learn and understand about your team in spring, and you really can push, design, and orchestrate it differently because the season is farther removed. And so there is some recovery time. As you can see, I like to practice spring later to get an uninterrupted spring, uh, strength cycle under our belt before spring even starts. The risk of that, right, is injury because there's less time to recover. But I like a strong, fiercely competitive, and ready team to, to really go very hard in spring practice, very physical, really competitive. And therein, I think you really forge the identity um, and develop your culture. And a year ago, if I were to trace the thread back to watching our team play, and it just never felt like, and it was my fault, it never felt like they were developed like a normal team that I'd coached. And quite frankly, without spring practice, I underestimated that value and I underestimated the summer value of training together. Um, And those things um, really led to um, some um, some deficiencies just in terms of will development is what I'll call it, um, and grit that normally are our strength. Um, But yeah, going back to your question, spring ball is my favorite time of year. 
uh, because it's just the purest form of football with guys developing, learning, straining, becoming, and competing. And that's where so many jobs are earned. And when it's in the fall and fall camp, you're always just a little bit concerned, right, about if we go that hard, what about the first game and will we have our whole team? And, and so it's not quite the same. Uh, so I think spring is essential. And again, as I've just said, it's my favorite time. It's the purest form of football in terms of my passion, which is the development of a team and development of individuals. So I think the off season and spring to me is when I really come to life. And, and it just is my favorite. Uh, I look, I wake up every day, just so thankful I get to do that because I'm watching young people become in a setting where we're asking so much, um, even before the games hit. So yeah, uh, for our style of play, for um, for what I believe as a coach, yeah, spring and summer, as well as as well as the off season, that's where I think teams are made. Coach, um, you touched on that a little bit, but I wanted to ask you about time frame when it comes to spring football. Given the pandemic, you mentioned the fact that you like starting it a little later, but given the last season, how I guess it got pushed a little later than normal. Are you ever concerned about the short turnaround, so to speak, from that to spring football, and then now you got to go into July and then go into the fall? You know, um, we weighed that uh, that narrative pretty heavily uh, quite a while ago, as I was considering when I first became a head coach uh, 16 years ago, and and there's all different models, and some start just so soon after Christmas, or excuse me, after the bowl season, and then they like their strength cycle after that. Uh, some like to, um, you know, start spring practice and then go on spring break and come back. I, I have found, and what I believe in, is I love, love, love every minute of an uninterrupted cycle first because I think the value of spring practice, even though the risk of injury is greater in terms of return to play, what we get out of each practice, I think, is far greater. And it's worked uh, and building consistency and success over time, but that's what I like. I'm not so concerned about the pandemic because our players, in choosing not to play postseason, they had tons of time off. And so um, they, they couldn't have been more fresh coming back to the off offseason. Um, I'm talking physically, not the mental fatigue of the pandemic, but physically. And so, yeah, it, it was that was one other reason in my mind to even go the opposite way and make sure they train and get every workout possibly in before we start spring um, because of the off season and not having, we're normally playing off season in bowl games, right? And so many teams didn't play or, or chose not to play and we were one of them. Uh, that was to me another reason to just train and train and train and get our physical, physical capability built back. So I hope, hopefully you followed that train of thought, but that's, that's uh, not only was it an existing model, but in this case, it, it, te- it seemed to me to validate it even more. Coach, kind of observing from the outside, it looks like the secondary is a pretty key area for the program right now, not only short term, but long term. You obviously shuffled some coaches there as well. What, what are you looking for in the development of your secondary group? Yeah, it, it's, it's dead on. Um, they are vital to our success of the program moving forward. And so there was a time, um, Chris, where we were leading the league in pass defense. uh, It might have been two years in a row. Um, You'll have to validate that or verify it. It might have been three. I'm not sure, but we had really good players uh, back there. When you think about Quinn and you think about Juan and you think about Tim, and then uh, Brenton Nelson was back there at the same time. And so, and then Bryce, right? And all of a sudden you just, Throwing the ball against UVA really wasn't an option. And that directly contributes to points allowed. And so up to not last year, but the year before, we were on that exact same pace until about game six or seven. And then there were some injuries, and wow, did that change. And luckily, our offense was just kind of emerging there to where he could keep success going into the Orange Bowl. I wasn't sure, to be be honest, which version of secondary we had. Was it the first part? Or was it the second part? And I thought, I wanted to believe it was more the first part. Um, But a few players moving on and a few injuries. uh, Anyway, what I found was it was more the second part. And we didn't adapt soon enough in terms of uh, resources, um, time spent, and possibly even schematic changes right at that time to address what they currently were playing like. And so that in and of itself led to more big plays and, and really defense that didn't allow us 
to have the kind of season. I think probably two more games were winnable a year ago, um, but the number of big plays we allowed through the air just simply didn't allow that to happen. Um, they weren't the only contributor, but a key contributor, which I think is the point that you're making. And so after assessing in the offseason, um, so here's the, uh, if you train the or, or, or trace the organizational part, our, our resource allocation. So I was in the defensive room for a long, long time. And Robert and I were both on the opposite side. When I removed myself, our balance of coaches shifted heavily offensively with probably the most experienced, right, and the coordinator slash head coach on defense being removed. I never really addressed that with Ricky then being special teams only. Um, and when we added our 10th coach. And so I've just basically shifted resources now to compensate um, for what I think is a need to be addressed, but more importantly, an organizational and balance issue with work with workload that need, needed to happen probably a year ago. Um, and But the confidence I have in Nick and our defensive staff is so high, but as I watched it, it's not sustainable. Um, and I felt the same when I was a head coach and coordinator, right? And so I've seen the kind of the staff stretch now applying to the defense and had to address it um, and was just, a little, I think, just a little bit late and organizationally addressing it is what I would say from my standpoint. Okay, our next, okay, our next questions are going to come from Kurt Kurz, Brad, Brad Franklin, and Danielle, and Danielle Stein. Stein. Hey, Bronco, um, you mentioned in, in your opening statements about feeling like a sense of return to normal but still having protocols. Uh, how much do you have to be careful not to seem like you're – letting your guard down on that on that front yeah uh it, it's already um so i have a staff meeting following this call at four it is my first item of on that agenda um so i saw it today uh normally we have the team meeting chairs already set out for the players and today uh as we shifted to a different format getting ready for spring practice they had to um bring their own chairs uh, and set them up in the indoor facility they put them right back to where it was non-COVID. <laughs> I mean, it, that was the clearest feedback I could have ever gotten. We've been going now since they returned with six feet and it looked like this square. It takes up almost 50 yards. We're so far apart. And the minute the chairs weren't set up, <laughs> here they go. And they're, they're shoulder to shoulder. And I was like, oh, that's where we... So it was a great gift I got back because <laughs> it wasn't orchestrated. I didn't even... You're right. It wasn't some social experiment, but it just uh, reiterated to me yeah, I, I can't relax at all, nor can I expect um, just everyone to make the social choices necessary. The structure has to drive the behavior. Um, and I was hoping the behavior would be by itself and ready to go. This, they're so anxious to be back together, and they're so anxious for normal. It's just this magnetic thing, <laughs> for lack of a better word, that just is sucking them back together. So, yeah, I, I have to be the... The gatekeeper, I guess, is the is the word I'll use. And how do you address what you described, I think, as kind of a, a lack of grit or just, uh, you know, and, and how much of that was pandemic related? Oh, it was almost all pandemic related because the structure that I employed, which is really what I love to do most, um, my number one concern, as I told the players and the parents, was their health and safety. And we had almost zero COVID issues during the season because of how far and, and how well we would design that part of it, I spent so much time on that um, that I spent not nearly as much time, which most of my time is normally on how tough can we be, how hard can we try, how physical can we be, where's the competitive settings. I, man, that didn't even manifest till about one and four. And then it was, oh, okay, there is another part here. that, um, And so that is... I think they're completely tied together. My job, though, right, was to see them both and be able to pull both of those off. And I missed. It's hard to say it's a miss, right, when your team is healthy and safe and 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 we navigate playing football in the pandemic with no games being affected by us. Um, but I believe we could have played better in addition to that. Um, but I was learning as we went, and I could have done better. having lots of time off and lots of um you know a chance to to get right for spring i'm just curious who all you're expecting uh, will be out 
practice yeah I, so i have a list um and that list uh there were 13 players uh that are out um or had surgery or for one reason or other and they're they're out at di they're all at different stages so i'll list those names um and then you know possibly you could follow up uh, later with kelly as to where they stand and so josh ahern is out ira armstead is limited um, Lee Dudley, a long snapper, Tuckle, uh, Tucker Finkelstein, a long snapper, Elijah Gaines, um, Chris Glazer, Nick Grant. These are all surgeries. Donovan Johnson, Nusi, Milani, Ugo, uh, Zach Teeter, Josh Rawlings, Samson Reed. So almost all were surgeries that aren't quite back. Um, and rather than have them back for spring and risk that, uh, they won't be back until the fall. So almost every player that's not back was surgery related. this spring that's different is you have the group of guys who have exercised their additional year of eligibility. Yeah. So what are you going to be looking for out of that group who are going to be, some of them were the leaders last year, but now even more of leaders. Um, what are you just kind of looking for from them? Wow. Um, so that's a really good question. The, um, I'm going to have to go back farther because uh, when I presented that option for those players, um, it was a, a blunt conversation, but they weren't to come back unless they were passionate about becoming more than they already were and helping the team become more than it already was. Otherwise, it wasn't okay for them to come back. So again, they had to be passionate about becoming more than they currently were individually, and they had to be passionate, and not just kind of passionate. I mean, I had to be convinced that they wanted the team to be more than it was. And those players for this offseason – have been so impressive um, and so when I watch Mandy Alonzo uh, it, it is the best I've ever seen him train and work and be Devonte Cross uh, would be another in that same category with it just is it's just fierce and how hard that he's trying Joey Blunt this was Joey Blunt's first off season being healthy and his numbers have gone just through the roof in terms of his strength and his size and his speed and but every player that has chosen to come back under those circumstances, they are driving this team. And uh, to their credit, that's what they said they would do. And so I appreciate them keeping their word, but the team notices and they see it. And else, else they weren't welcome back. But they all chose that under those conditions, and they're doing exactly what they said. And again, they're all doing that. I know I didn't mention everyone, but they're, they're, all, they're all doing that. Uh, hey, Bronco, uh, can you talk about what you're uh, hoping to gain in the spring as far as your running game goes? Uh, and uh, is Nick Hollins, did he return to the team? Yep, so uh, Mike Hollins is back. Um, and we also will have uh, – so Devin Darrington, a grad transfer from Harvard, he won't be here during the spring, but he'll be coming also. But, yes, Mike Hollins is back. Ronnie Walker is also back. Wayne Talapapa um, – has been almost unbeatable in every drill in the offseason. So this is the deepest our running backs have been since I've been the coach. Uh, we also have added Ahmad Faustin as a mid-year first year. And so that's five quality running backs and great competition. And so I really like that. As you've seen, so the last two years, um, so even in the transition from Bryce to Brennan, we still hovered right around that 30-ish point mark offensively, which is a great mark when you're changing quarterbacks. So I love that capacity and just seeing what's possible. Um, as you already know, um, the traditional runs from our running backs um, haven't been our strength, but our quarterback runs have been very good to where that when you put those two things together that's kind of become our running game so we would love to see some more um, production from traditional runs while we keep the creativity of our quarterback runs knowing that K, uh, kt right keton is also part of that so you have brennan as a possibility you have ira as a possibility you have keton as a possibility and then you have the the uh, traditional tailback runs or single back runs that we would love to get more out of and so I like the possibilities and probably for the it's probably our best chance ever, Jerry. And now the time I've been at UVA to have the number of resources with our offensive line, almost all intact and returning. 
um, with a great new tight end that's already arrived uh, from Oklahoma State and Grant Mish returning. There's there's a physical presence that it could be where um, this then is the year where it's UVA's run game finally breaks through. You know, and we've had to be pretty creative, but I've liked the production through Bryce and Brennan a year ago. It's just taken some pretty creative options. So I'd like to get more traditional without losing the creativity. I'd like more impact and more production from traditional-ish type of runs. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. And if I could follow, uh, how can you expand uh, Lavelle Davis's role and, and how important is spring to that? Yeah, um, it, it's pretty simple. You just need to throw it to him more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's the guy's already, as soon as he just goes and lines up, he's already open because there's no corners that are six seven, at least not that I know of. And so he he just he's earning right, and you know that's how I work right. He's earning trust. And so uh, he had. I thought he had a very strong first year. I really did, and I was I was so glad. And so as he keeps going, that just means more opportunities, right? And so that'll happen this spring. It'll happen in the fall. But the easy answer is, yeah, we just got to throw it to him more. And even if someone's on him, really, so what? You know, they're five ten. So I mean. <laughs> There, there's more balls that in the 50-50 category that can go his way, and we intend to do that. Uh, but again, not just for the sake of because of the height, but he was showing enough capability and production as the season went where he's he's warranted considering now the ball going there more frequently. Bronco, you mentioned Dante Cross. In his first five years here, he lined up the greatest <laughs> time the quarterback <laughs> secondary has that not being able to find one home has that affected his performance and you see one one single role for him this year where we can hit him to be a utility guy yeah it, it's absolutely affected his performance jeff and he has such a good attitude and he's such a good athlete that luckily we had him as the program is and was building growing and maturing and we just needed players at certain spots and with his uh, metrics and when you look at his testing numbers, anytime he needed a good athlete who was smart and willing, he just would do whatever we asked him. Uh, has that hurt his performance and production at any one spot? Certainly. Yeah, it, it has because um, he's learned just enough at each spot to perform but not really excel. And we're so hopeful starting from this spring going all the way through the fall, he can play one position. We're so hopeful. I wish I could promise, because it, but injuries always affect that, right? And so we've added a, a graduate transfer at corner that came in from Louisville, um, Anthony Johnson. And hopefully that will solidify and allow Devontae just to play one spot and not have to play multiple spots. Again, injury and wear and tear of the season could still affect that, but for his sake, right? Because he's a team first player. If there is one, he just, he's, he's so unselfish which I appreciate, but I would love to give back to him and just let him play one spot to, to really excel rather than um, contribute out of necessity at so many different spots. I, I'm hopeful safety is a spot he could play, Jeff. Yeah, Coach, you mentioned uh, Thompson and then obviously came in as a quarterback and did, did a little of everything for you. With his shoulder, is quarterback uh, in the plans for this year or – what are the ways you'll be using him? I would say um, throwing the ball is in our plans for him. Um, so the, the best way I would describe Keaton is I saw a commercial regarding Taysom Hill in New Orleans, and he came on screen and they said, what position do you play? And he said, football. That is exactly how we intend to use Keaton. And could he play quarterback? Yes. Could he play running back? Yes. Could he play receiver? No, I should say will. Will he play quarterback? Yes. Will he play tight end? Yes. Will he play running back? Yes. Will he play slot receiver? Yes. Will he play X receiver? Yes. Will he play Z receiver? Yes. Um, will he Will he be on the punt team? Certainly. Will he be on punt return? Yes. So he just whatever, however many boxes, we're, we're on a mission to have as many boxes checked for positions um, ever played. And he's so smart and so capable. So uh, yeah, yes to everything probably that you'd ask about how we'll use KT. Well, the follow-up, maybe he's not the answer to this one, but what can you tell me about place kicker and punter? Those are uh, two 
Just, just so you know, I had to bring a sheet just because I didn't know the answer to that. Um, so, um, so what I, what I really, so uh, Brendan Farrell, Brendan Farrell, uh, from a year ago, we started to see things in, in practice where he could be the heir apparent as a punter, and so as of right now, that's what we think in terms of place kicker, uh, Justin Dunkel, um, as well as Hunter Pearson, who's been injured, but now he's not. And so somewhere in those three, as of today, I'm not predicting any others couldn't be added or et cetera. This spring will have something to do with that. But it looks like Farrell could be our punter, and then between Dunkel and Pearson will be our place kicker slash kickoff player um, is where we currently stand. Yep. He was kind of progressing to becoming more of a regular starter. What what do you hope for him just as he gets you know readjusted to the game again? Yeah, I hope he's a regular starter. I mean, and just just having him back, wow, does our team look different? And so there were uh, I I counted six players that opted out from a year ago that are all back, and we're better because they're back. Um, so Tenye Dixon, Aaron Famui, Mike Hollins, Jai. Uh, Luke Wentz and Brandon Williams, and just having six quality players, great people who are on scholarship or are good athletes that we recruited and that we love, it just – six is a big number, right? That that makes a difference. And so Aaron having um, – man, we were down to – I think it was just four defensive linemen by the end of the season, maybe three. I don't remember for sure. And Tommy Chris came over. Um, but so glad to have Aaron back because he's a really good player, fits well within our program, and he's really capable. So um, we're glad that they're all back, but I'm just bringing that up as a mention or kind of a takeoff from the Aaron Famui question. Coach, linebacker was obviously and kind of has been a position of strength for you guys over the years. Charles Snowden and Zane Zandier gone. What's sort of the plan there and what yeah. you see in terms of the guys who might step in depth-wise? So the um, – the, the immediate heir apparents, and then the rest, we'll have to see how they emerge through the spring. But the immediate heir, appra- heir apparents, right, uh, Noah Taylor and um, uh, Nick Jackson, right? So those two, right, Nick played phenomenally last year. Noah was kind of battling a back injury a year ago, uh, actually played better the year before. But both of those we really like. Uh, Elliot Brown has returned which we like that possibility. We've had another grad transfer in Chico Bennett from uh, Georgia Tech. And then there's a whole slew of young players that we're so excited about. But rather than mentioning them, that would be better just to track them through the spring. Um, So we think we're deep at linebacker. The names will be new, but we like the capabilities of what those players look like. Thanks, Bronco. This isn't spring related, but uh, you guys had your pro day, 31 teams there, lots of guys out working out, and the team coming out to support their guys. How much of a of a motivating factor can that be for the guys who weren't participating? And what do you say about your program that you you know had so many people that the NFL was interested in looking at. Uh, so Hank, I, I only got part of your question. Um, I, it was about pro day, I know, and I heard thirty-one teams. Could you repeat uh, any other parts that I missed before I address yeah, it? Just, just uh, first of all, what is the motivationing motivational benefit for the guys who were not participating or oh. underclassmen or whatever? Oh, and what does it generally say about your program that you know you had so many people that the NFL was interested in looking? At? Yeah, it was. So I had a picture taken. Uh, Jim actually asked him to take it. It was one of my best days at UVA, um, that moment, because we had different eras come back for Pro Day, you know, because there was a, a group of our team that didn't get Pro Day a year ago. And so having some, some players come back from that team, as well as a few others that trained in Quinn Blanding and Chris Peace, right from a previous team. And I just, I just, um, sat back and watched that day of these guys that I just, man, I, I was so happy to see them. And then they were so fit and trained and played well or, or uh, performed well. And I saw 
because of COVID, right, our, the rest of our team was looking through the glass doors that were down in the, in, in the indoor, and it, you could see all just faces lined up, you know, with their hands to the side, and they were, you could see their noses against the glass, and they were just like every little peephole was lined up. Um, and our team performed well, and the players performed well. And it's becoming expected now that um, we showed a picture today of Charles Snowden when he arrived at UVA. I put it on screen today for the team meeting, and our team chuckled because how skinny and, and young he looked. And then it was side by side with how he was on pro day. <laughs> and it was just the, the players were just um, captivated by the work he had put in and who he had become. That's how I felt with the team or the players that were participating. I was just captivated from thinking about being in their homes to now here they are either already playing in the NFL or getting ready to and just how proud I was of them. And, and that so many teams are acknowledging one of the one of the uh, player personnel people just said, we know exactly what we're getting when we take one of your guys and there won't be someone tougher, won't be someone more physical. They'll always be doing what they're supposed to do and you can build teams around them. And I just, you know, it made me feel so good to be contributing to um, those type of people, not only players, but those type of people um, that are building a reputation for themselves. And. And that's, man, that's my real intent to, to have this program be able to win and build those kind of people at the same time uh, to where this becomes the destination where others want to come to build their teams around those type of people. And then I think we're, then I think college football becomes pretty significant if, if, the, if that's kind of what's being accomplished.